in this week's parsha, Akev. We read about that if a Jew adheres fully to the mitzvahs, to the commandments, he will ultimately merit the greatest level of bounty and blessing, which we can discuss at the moment. Now, in Hebrew, the word im means if. Akev also could mean if, but usually the word that you that is used for if is always im. However, in this verse here, in this posuk, there's a voya akev tishmun esamishpotum oela. And if you would listen, adhere to these laws, ushmartem vasisim osam, you'll retain them and you will do them. If you do that, God will uphold the covenant, the chesed, the kindness, which he promised to your avos. So the obvious question is, if the Torah could have written im, what is the right ekev? In Hebrew, the word okev means the heel. The reason why Yaakov was called Yaakov, as the Torah tells us, Rivka, their mother, gave birth to twins. It says, Yodo ach ochezes bakevesov, because when they came out, Yaakov's hand, who was the second child, was holding onto the heel of his brother Esav. Therefore, he was called Yaakov, from the word Ekev, from the word heel. So the word Ekev, although here it means if, but it's alluding to the heel. What relevance does this have to do with the heel? So Rashi cites the Midrash, that if one even adheres to the ordinary, the light, the less important mitzvos, which are normally trampled upon by one's heel, if one observes even those mitzvos, the mitzvos that are neglected, the mitzvos that are cast aside, which is the equivalent of trampling on them, which you heal, then he will merit the greatest degree of value, bounty, blessing, protection, you, you'll be considered something special. Now the question is why? Why if a person observes even the mitzvahs kalos, shodum doshba cave of even the ordinary mitzvahs, the lighter mitzvahs, which a person normally neglects, which a term is one tramples on with his heels, he will merit all this. He'll have a special level of acclaim in God's eyes. Why? We've mentioned many times, the Gemara tells us, that the gematria, the numerical value of Torah, is 200 and, 611. And since we heard the first two of the Ten Commandments directly from Hashem, Anoche Hashem Elokecho V'lo Yelocho, Elohim Achim Al Ponai, so together it's 613. So Jew was obligated 613 mitzvos which is known. We have 365 negative com- positive negative commandments and 248 positive commandments. It's Shasa Ramach. Shama, Shasa, 365 negative commandments, 248 p- positive commandments. Now, you say to any Jew, how many commandments are we obligated to observe? 613. But factually, it's not true. There's certain mitzvahs which only have relevance to the Kohen. The Kohen has an obligation to officiate in the temple, the base of Mikdosh. The Kohen has an obligation to bless the Tzibur when he comes upon a congregation of Jews. It's a positive commandment. An ordinary Jew, he's not permitted to ascend, to give the blessing together with the Kohanim. He's not permitted. He's not permitted to officiate. There's a mitzvah to bring the sacrifices. A Kohen is not permitted to marry certain women, a divorcee, a woman has been defiled, a normal Jew is permitted. So the, that, that negative commandment only has relevance to the Kohen, has no relevance to the what? To the non-Kohen. So what does it mean we're obligated in 613 mitzvahs? The Ramak, Ramosh Kudviro, 
in his work, Tomer Dvora, speaks about the mitzvah v'hafta l'recho kamocha. There's a mitzvah, you must love your fellow Jew as you love yourself. Now, why must you love your fellow Jews as you love yourself? Actually, he's not, he's not the equivalent of yourself. You're yourself. He's a, he's, a, he's a third party. So he explains that when we speak about the Jewish soul, the Jewish soul, the, the neshama of a Jew, is only one component of the larger entity called, called Kalal Yisrael, the Jewish people. The, enti- the spiritual entity of the Jewish people is comprised of all various souls which comprise one total neshama. So in essence, every person's spirituality is interconnected with every other Jew's spirituality. So therefore, loving someone else is really the equivalent of loving myself. Because each person is really connected to the other. And each of us complement one another. So if a Jew does a mitzvah, you're in, it's an infusion of spirituality in the system which is referred to as the Jewish people. And if God forbid a person sins, the word chet means diminishment. It's a diminishment in the totality of the Jewish people. And this is the concept of Kol Yisrael, Rav Mzelozeh, why Jews responsible for one another. The reason why we're responsible for one another is because what we do affects and impacts positive and negatively on every one of us. So this is v'hafto d'recho kamocha, and this is, now it's very good, with this understanding, the famous Gemara, where there were three Gentiles, they wanted to convert to, to become Jews. They first went to Shammai, and each, each of them had a prerequisite. They would only convert on one condition. Shammai had a different personality than Hillel, and he immediately dismissed them. He drove them out, wasn't going to tolerate their preconditions. They come to Hillel, one comes to Hillel and says, I want to learn the Torah of Regalachas. Me, teach me one principle and which encompasses the Torah's entirety. So he said to this Gentile, Madisoni Loch Lechavrich Losase, Losavid, what you what you despise and you would not want to do to yourself, don't do to your fellow. Which is basically Vafto Recho Kamocha. He says, that's the principle. Uh, which encompasses the entire Torah, now you have to study the details, which is the application of that. So he, told, he said to him, V'hafto recho And Rebbe Kiva says, V'hafto recho kamocha is a klal godl batorah. That's a primary principle which encompasses the whole Torah. Now, you'd say, Ma'da soni loch, what you despise, l'chavr chlotase, l'savid. We understand. So that's bein on l'chavero, the two parts of the Torah. There's the part of Torah which is between man and man, and the part of Torah which is between man and God. So between man and man, we understand what you would not do, unto, what you despise, you don't want to be done to you, don't do unto your friend, to your fellow. But Shabbos and, and Kashrus, and we're in combination of wool and lemon, linen, or various other things which have no relevance to human relations, what, does that have to, what, what relevance does have about the sunny loch, what you despise, don't do unto your friend? But if you understand it, the way we're explained with the Ramak, with Moshe Kudaviro, that all Jewish souls are interconnected. And what benefits one benefits all. And what is a diminishment, a diminishment and the detraction of one is the detraction from all. So therefore, it's even made on Lamokum. If a, a Jew eats non kosher, as he diminishes his own soul, he diminishes every other soul. If he violates Shabbos, as he's diminishing himself spiritually, he's diminishing the whole system. The whole system is being put into jeopardy. So therefore, this principle of what you despise and you don't want to be done unto yourself, don't do unto your fellow, not only is ben odom lechavero, in the application of between man and his fellow, it's, it's even ben odom lamokom, it's between man and God. Because the consequence, the ramification of that, applies, touches upon, positive and negatively, every person, every Jew's soul, for that reason if you understand it this way. So let's say now the Chovetz um, Chaim, very often he cites the Rav Chaim Vital, who was, was the primary student of Darizal, who recorded all the writings, all the teachings of Darizal, all the Kisvi Arizal were recorded by Rav Chaim Vital. 
he writes that as we have Ramach Mitzvah Sasei, we have 240 positive commandments, it co corresponds to the Ramach, the 240 parts of the human body. There's a corresponding factor. The Chavetz Chaim in the Mishabura writes that in the laws of Kriyashma, in Kriyashma, there are 245 let words, 245 words in the three paragraphs, and we conclude Hashem al Memes, and then the Chazan says Hashem al Memes afterwards. Why does he conclude the additional three words? Because it's the Kriyashma, the three paragraphs are 245, and when he concludes 240, the additional three words, it's 248. Meaning that what is Kriyashma? It's accepting upon ourselves the dominion of Hashem, the dominion of God. That's what Kriyashma is. It's referred to as Kabbalah Soma al We accept the yoke of heaven upon ourselves. So the Mishbur says, we, when we say those words, every aspect of our being, we accept the yoke of heaven. There's no part of ourselves that we're not accepting God's dominion. That's, that's the whole idea of 248. That's why that 248 is a very primary number to correspond to every aspect of our being. What about a person doesn't davo a minion? So what do you say? Kriyashma, we introduce it with Kel Melech Nemon. It's three words. Kel Melech Nemon, you add that to 245, you have 248 again. So the 248 number is a very important number, okay? So Rav Chaim Vital says, as you have 248 parts to the body, the 248 parts to the neshama. The Jewish soul has 248 components, which, create, which compose the total Jewish soul. Every time we do a mitzvah, the mitzvah nourishes, is an infusion of spirituality into that part of the soul. You put on tefillin. Tefillin corresponds to a certain part of the neshama. That nourishes the, the soul, the spiritual need of the soul. Eat matzah, sukkah, whatever the mitzvah is, each one corresponds to that part of the neshama. It's 248. This is the 248 mitzvah sasei, 248 positive commandments. The Chavetz Chaim writes that just as the human body, as much as you eat and you're nourished, if time passes, it has to be refueled, has to be reinfused with nourishment. Otherwise, over time, the body wanes and dies. Identically, the neshama has to be nourished. The soul is meant to be eternal. So if a person doesn't infuse it with, e with e e eternal energy, how does it live eternally? So therefore, God gave the Jew spiritual nourishment, which impacts for all eternity. Those are the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs are forever. You put on tefillin and every day of, of your life, from the time you bar mitzvah till the day you die, when you're supposed to put on tefillin. And if you put it on, qualitatively speaking, you put it on lishmo, with the right intention, not just by rote. And you study Torah and everything else you do. Every aspect of your behavior impacts on your spirituality to advance it, enhance it, and to spiritualize it. And that spiritualization is part of eternity, and that, that's eternal fuel. And therefore the neshama lives on and thrives and advances forever. But if the neshama is left deficient, right? We say, Rishon b'chayim kru amesim. Rishon, the evil, even when they're alive, they're considered as if they're dead. Rishon b'chayim kru amesim. Tzadikim b'misosom. A tzadik, even if he passes away, kru he's, he's It's like he's, he's alive. Why? Because the soul lives on. The soul even thrives to a greater degree after the person passes away than when he's alive. Because the soul, when you're alive, all it does is it attributes to, to your function and to your spirituality, but it's in a very compromised state. It's in a suppressed state. What, and it's really, it's on a, a gathering mission. It's absorbing. Life is an absorption period. We serve to absorb for the future. As it says in the Gemara, Hayom la sosem, l'mochel kabel scharam. Today it's to do, tomorrow it's to receive the reward. That's, so that's what it is. So therefore when we pass away, we're more alive in terms of our essence 
than what, what after than when we're living. The Russia, since he doesn't address the needs of his soul, of his neshama, when a person dies, he's, he becomes non-functional. Here, even when he's alive, he's non-functional. Because what is the primary function? Could you imagine a person is comatose his whole life? You say, that's alive. Relatively speaking, he's, he's totally non-functioning. So if the essence of a Jew is to address the, his spiritual needs of the neshama, and he neglects it totally, so basically, spiritually, he's comatose. He's only think, functioning as what? As an intellectual animal. Therefore, Rishoyim, Bechayim, the Russia, even when he's fully alive, fully functional in the physical sense, but for his essence, what he is, he's not functional. So therefore, he's Kuriyam Asim. He's the equivalent of a non-existent person, even when he's alive. That's the difference. So, if we have mitzvahs, Odom Dosh Ba'kevov, if a person, the mitzvahs that a person neglects, mitzvahs people neglect, because they don't see its value, it's not that important. And therefore they're underestimated. And people, most people neglect them. They only address and focus on the primary mitzvahs. So it comes out, the Jewish people are deficient. Their spirituality hasn't been addressed in the totality of the spirituality. Because you have to address every mitzvah because every mitzvah provides a spirituality which addresses the total spirituality of the individual and Klal Yisrael. So the person who picks up the slack, who even pays attention to mitzvah, what is he doing? What is, what's his contribution? His contribution is not only on a personal level, it's on a totality level. He's infusing into Klal Yisrael that we should have relevance to Shlemus. We say that the Torah Hashem Tamimo, God's Torah is, is perfect. Why is it perfect? Because if God is perfect, anything that is directly connected to God is perfect. Shlemus. Therefore, a person, an animal that's brought as a sacrifice cannot have be blemished. It has to be tomim, it has to be perfect because it reflects the perfection. When we serve God, we, should, we have to serve God with perfection. Because how do you come before the king, which is perfect, and serve him with anything less than perfection? It's totally inappropriate. So if Klal Yisrael is God's people, you're supposed to cleave to God. What cleaves to God? Something which has relevance to God. So if we have Ramach, which addresses the total totality of the spirituality of Jewish people, and we're not deficient, then we have relevance to him. We have greater relevance to him. What happens if we're deficient? Right? It's like we're maimed. It's like a maimed, we're not in our fullest, fullest form. It's inappropriate. So the person who provides the nourishment for the soul, for the spirituality of Jewish people, to address the deficiency, to bring about perfection. What's his value? What's his level of worthiness? He deserves everything. Therefore, that's what Torah says, if you even, it's not, if you even address the mitzvahs that Odin Dosh Ba'kevov, this person's picking up the slack. Other people, they neglect it, they minimize it. It's equivalent. They throw it aside. They don't focus on it. God owes that person more than anybody. Therefore, what does he merit? He merits the bris, the chesed. God will love you. God will bless you. God will increase you. Your, your, your children, your herds, your flocks, your, your, your harvest, everything. It's the ultimate level. That's one understanding. There's a midrash. There's a verse in Mishle in Proverbs on the post of Ekev Tishmun. Zeshomer Akos of Orachayim Pentafalis. The path of life you may weigh, you may evaluate. Nogu Maglaselo Seida. The movements of the furrows are unknown. What does this mean? Omre Babar Kano. Shlote Yoshi Vishokal Mitzvah Seshal Torah. A person is not able to evaluate 
the true value of mitzvos. Right? We read in Pirkei Avos, Havizor mitzvah kalke b'chamura. You should be as careful with an a, a, a ordinary mitzvah as a more severe mitzvah. Why? Because ki ena to yudeh ma'an schor shal mitzvahs. Person it's, doesn't know. There's no way to quantify or even to relate to the innate value of a mitzvah. It's something which is an impossibility. It's not, not possible to know. But God kept it a secret. Not a question of why did God keep it a secret. God should have said this is this value and this is lesser value. More and lesser value. Why not? So that's what, this is what Shlomo Melech in, in Proverbs and Mishlei is saying. Shlotei odom yoshi shokum mitzvah shal Torah. Veroe, a person would say, Eze mitzvah shchoro merubo. Voso, he says, whatever is more advantageous for me, that's the one I'm doing. Loma, why? No ma gusel oseda. Mutu tolin hein shvili a Torah. Then mutu tolin, they're uncertain. Oh, it's interesting. According to what we're saying, that every mitzvah, even a mitzvah kalo, let's say tztoka, charity, it's not like observing Shabbos. A person is, let's say, he's perfect, but he's missing a finger. He's still a what? He's a maimed person. But you realize the a finger is not as important as an eye. And an eye is not as important as the heart. And the heart is the most important, but let's see, the eye is not as important maybe as losing one, one lung. A person has two lungs or one kidney. But factually, whatever is the location of deficiency, the person is not a whole person. So therefore, as be fully functional with everything interacts with everything and everything complements everything, even the simple mitzvah takes on a greater value. Therefore, you don't know the value in terms of the interplay. The interplay, right? If you can't use your hand, even though you're a functional human being, but you can't, you know, a person has to sign a billion dollar deal and he has to put only his own signature. And because he's missing his fingers, he can't sign the check or sign the document, right? So you have a heart, you're functioning. But by closing it, by putting your signature, what you're able to bring about, but if you weren't, doesn't have fingers. Well, fingers aren't that important, it's true. But the times, there may be a moment where they're very important. And that may, may make the difference in your life and many other people's lives. You don't know. So I was thinking, we'll see in a moment, we say, the Mishnah says in Pirkei Ovos, based on one's pain, one's difficulty, that will determine the value of a mitzvah. Because what determines the value of a mitzvah? Displaying one's dedication to what degree you're committed to sacrifice for a mitzvah. Therefore, the fum tzara agra, for instance, you have a person who's a very wealthy man. Poor man comes, he gives him five dollars. What does five dollars mean to a very rich man? It doesn't mean very much. But a, a man who's of limited income, and he says, he gives that five dollars, that's something very meaningful. It actually, it borders on sacrifice. So value-wise, in terms of the recipient, it's the same five dollars. He can't buy more whether he receives it from the rich man or the poor man. But in terms of the one who gives the five dollars, it's a different dimension of mitzvah. Because for one it was a sacrifice, for one it was not a sacrifice. L'fum tzara agra. So if, if the ordinary person minimizes the value of a mitzvah kala. They say, what's its worth? If I could do this, why do that? It has greater value. The way it's perceived has greater value. But this other person, he takes up the slack. So what did he do? He went against the grain. The grain of society of Jews is, this is, should not be valued as you're valuing it. And you look like you're like some kind of fanatic. The greatest minds don't value it, and you're valuing that. No? The person says, you know, it's God's word, I value it. So what is he doing? It's like the Fum Tzara He's willing to do things that people don't do. When you go against the grain, that has greater value. So therefore, have because even though in terms of actual mitzvah kala, if you pit it against the mitzvah hamura, it may be less of value, but because of the way it's perceived, that it's not worthwhile doing, and despite that you do do it, 
So we're playing at this lefum tzar agra. Because mentally, emotionally, a person normally doesn't do it. See, he's overriding the perception, negating that perception to do it despite what everybody else thinks, regardless of what people think about him. You know, we say uh, Rambam, based on Mishnah Pirkei in the laws of Talmud Torah, writes, it's known, in a Baishan Lomid, a person who's embarrassed easily, you cannot study. You cannot learn. Why? Because you listen to a class, it's being taught, and you don't understand the first time. Other people have more keen minds. They understand it the first time, and you don't understand it. So you should ask the question, but you don't ask the question because you're embarrassed because if you have the question, it doesn't reflect well on you as a student the way you're going to be seen by others, you know? He has a sli slightly uh, backward mind. He therefore, he didn't get it the first time. So Chazal tell us, and the Rambam rules this in, in, in the Lord's Talmud Torah, in Abay Shen Lomit, if you're shy, you, if you're, you're concerned about the way you're going to be seen, embarrassed, you go nowhere. What, what, are you, what are you sitting in the class for? To sit there in the class or it's to, to learn? And unless you ask the question, unless you have a question and you're too embarrassed to ask the question, it is a good question. And that question may even refute what the teacher said. But you don't want to ask the question. So who's, who's, who's at a loss? You're at a loss. But let's say despite that, you do ask the question. And you're seen as not being the top of the class. And you're doing it for the sake of Torah. What is that? That's the Fum Tzara Agra. You're willing to sacrifice your ego for the sake of the Torah itself. So therefore, everybody's studying Torah, but what are you willing to do for it? What is everybody else willing to do for it? The other people comes easily. To you, it doesn't come easily. You have to make look as a, a maybe a, a slight buffoon or seen as lesser rather than more for the sake of Torah. So the same, that's Mitzvah. Havizor b'mitzvah kalam b'chamura. Even though the perception is, and therefore people are very much influenced by the way others value things, and despite that you don't value it as others, therefore the mitzvah kala takes on a special level of value because you are valuing the mitzvah kala, the lesser mitzvah. Now listen to this. Torah what would this be analogous to? That the Torah did not reveal the va true value of a mitzvah, so a person should not be able to evaluate and say, I'll do what has the greatest value. Very famous midrash. Lamelech Shayyab Pardis. King had an orchard. And he wanted that every type of fruit tree and every type of plant, every type of flower should be planted in this orchard. Vichnis Bopalim. And he brought workers, laborers into this orchard. Vlogilem Amelech Shar Natius Akerim. But he did not reveal to them what they're going to get paid for which sapling they're going to plant. Didn't tell them the fee, what they're going to be paid. Because if he would reveal in advance the value of one over the other, one has. They'll see immediately which they're going to have the greatest fee. They're only going to plant that one particular type of tree. So it's not going to be a fully planted orchard. But the king wants it should be fully planted. That this orchard contains everything. For the same reason God did not reveal reward for the mitzvah, because if he would have revealed it, some mitzvahs would be addressed and other mitzvahs would what, remain unaddressed. Therefore, since it's important that a Jew keeps all the mitzvahs, therefore, he did not reveal the schar. This case many years ago, there was a couple. The story goes back 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. And the, this couple, he was a, a Rebbe in the high school, and he was married 21 years. He had no children. They had no children. And it's known there's a schooler, there's a special good omen that if you adopt a child, adoption brings a special siyapted shemai divine assistance that you should merit to have children. So until then, they didn't want to adopt. They married 20 years, 20, they agreed to adopt it. A child adopted a newborn baby from Israel, a Jewish child. Parents were, I don't know what the story was, but they adopted this child. A few months after they adopted the child, the wife goes to the doctor for a checkup. 
and um, they did a blood test. And the doctor says, you know, you know, we haven't checked your iodine in a long time. So he's going to write that on the prescription, check iodine. Comes back, and the doctor notices she's slightly deficient in iodine. And it's known that in terms of a woman conceiving, her iodine level has to be nearly perfect. And if she's deficient, she cannot conceive. So he gave her an iodine supplement. Within a few months later, she conceived. And she had a child. So the child was born. They were married 22 years when the, when the, the child was born. This is the story. What's iodine worth? You know what I mean? A little bit of iodine. A mitzvah But the mitzvah versus the totality of the person, what does it bring about? It brought about a child, which gave them their whole life to perpetuate their own existence even after they pass away, that they have a child to carry on in that place. Do we understand the value of a mitzvah kala in the interplay of the totality of, of the world, the totality of Klal Yisrael, totality of the spirituality of, of, of the world, of purpose? Who understands it? What does the king need? An orchard that has every representation of plant and, and fruit and so on and so forth. Because it's, otherwise it's deficient. You know, a person builds a, wants to build a 100-story luxury tower and they build only 99 stories. And there's another building that's putting up a 75-story luxury tower. They build all 75 towers and put the penthouse on top. They say, which is, which, is, which is perfect, which is not. But this is, has so many more, has nearly 25 floors more. Yeah, but you didn't put it on, you never completed it. And putting on one floor is not putting on, right? It's missing 24 floors, the other one, compared to this. But what's, what's more perfect building? The lesser building is more perfect than the larger building. Of course, the other one was never completed. But it's only a mitzvah kala. Doesn't make a difference. The difference, we say sometimes, the whole is, is, is greater than, than, than its makeup, than its, the sum total of its parts. The totality of something is greater than, than the sum total of its parts. That's the difference. So even though what made the difference was a mitzvah kala, was an ordinary mitzvah, but the totality is greater than its parts. You have a computer, you're missing a screw, or what a tight, tiny little whatever component. But that's not, the, that's not what the computer's about. It may be a fuse. Without the fuse, it doesn't work. You put in that fuse, which costs, relative to the computer, costs nothing. Now it works. The mitzvah kalin, the interplay of the totality, it's a, different, it's a whole, t- totally different reality. And really what I'm saying in terms of the concept of fum tzara agro, it's really, it lies in this midrash. God does not, we say, God doesn't give reward in this world, the true reward. So simply, the understanding is why? Because if this world is finite and spirituality is relative to infinite, how do you give infinite reward in a finite life? It's impossible. So at best, you get little nibblings in this world. That's all you get. But the Mitzvah says differently. God removed reward of mitzvahs in this world. If a person would see, you know, we say, Tzadik Viralo, Rosh Vitovlo. If let's say every Tzadik would be Tovlo, and every Rosh would be Ralo, every Tzadik would have an exceptional life in the material existence. And every Russia would live a life of dread. You understand? Nobody's going to be a Russia. So God created a confusing situation. So God doesn't display and doesn't show the value of a mitzvah in this world. Why? Because he wants Jews to do it for the sake of the mitzvah. He doesn't want you to do it for the sake of it. He wants you to show, to demonstrate your emunah, your belief and your trust in him that ultimately, as it says, Ani Hashem nem l'shalem socher. I am good to pay the reward, ultimately when it's meant to be paid, after you pass away or at the end of time. It's interesting, the Gemara tells us in one location that 
many forbidden things, items, God has a representation in a permitted context which is identical to the forbidden. For instance, uh, pork is not permitted. It's a non-kosher species. So the Gemara says there's a certain fish. The tongue of that fish has the exact same taste as pork. So if you want to know what pork tastes like, you eat the tongue of that fish, you know what it's about. You know, so therefore, the curiosity won't kill the cat this time. Because you'll be able to satisfy to know what it is. If a woman gives birth, the Torah tells us, to a male, she's contaminated, even though she's menstruating, she's contaminated for seven days. But for 33 days, after she goes to the mikveh after seven days, for 33 days, although she's menstruating, she's permitted to the husband on a Torah level. That's menstruation. She's a menstruant. A Jew's not permitted to be with his wife when she's a menstruant. This menstruant you're permitted to be with. So if you want to know what it means to have relations with a woman, although she's in the state of menstruation, it's permitted to know. For instance, if a man is not permitted to marry his sister-in-law. If his man, wife's brother, she was, he's widowed and she has children from his brother, he's not permitted. What about if the brother dies childless? There's a mitzvah of, of levered marriage. So you know what it's all about. So there's always an uh, alternate situation, which is the equivalent. You know what it's about. God says, we don't know Shal Mitzvos. But the Torah gives two examples of what it means, the reward of a mitzvah. So Reb Shimi Choy says, Shtei mitzvos gila Kodesh Baruch Ba'an Zchorah. The two mitzvahs the Torah reveals its reward. Achas Kala Shabachal. One is simple, not costly, not difficult. Vahas Chamur Shabachamur. The other one is very difficult to fulfill that mitzvah. Eloheim Kal Shabachalo Shluch HaKan. Sending away the mother bird. You come upon a mother bird nesting on its chicks or on its eggs. Send it away. What does Torah say? Harach to Yomim. You live, you have longevity. Varach to Yomim. Chamura Shabbat. What's the most difficult mitzvah to fulfill? Kibir Oveim. To honor a parent properly. Shabok Siv Leman Yarichun Yomecho. Harain Shovin Beman Schorim Bolam Azeh. So in this world, we see the Torah says the reward is identical. So the Torah is giving you a glimpse of something which is almost negligible in its doing and look at the reward. Something's the most difficult. So do we have an inkling of what it's about? So evidently it's not clearly in this world. It's not in this world. The difference is in the other world. In this world, here one's so difficult, one is relatively almost, one could do it with, with, without any difficulty. So, so what does it tell us? You don't know. There's no way that you even could be on the, begin understanding what its value is. It's interesting. Now, the Torah tells us you have to, the word mitzvah, what does the word mitzvah mean? Command, it's commandment. Who commanded you? God. God commands you to do a mitzvah kala. God commands you to do a mitzvah mura. Now you say to, and now all of a sudden you start evaluating what's more advantageous to me. But God says you have to do the lesser as you have to do the more severe. When you serve the master, it should not be for the sake of reward, for self-interest. So the person who evaluates, is it worthwhile or is it not worthwhile? Why is he doing the mitzvah? Is he doing the mitzvah purely selflessly for, because it's God's word? If it was God's word, he wouldn't make an evaluation. Because God said no less on the mitzvah kala as he said on the mitzvah mura. So the moment the person picks and chooses which yes, which not, what does that say? It's clearly there's a degree of self-interest. Because if there's no self-interest, why are you differentiating between the Kal and the Chamura? As a result of that, the person, if the person even addresses the Mitzvah Kalo, Shodom Dosh Vakevav, the Mitzvah which is neglected, which is trampled with, which they abuse, which is a disrespect, and he addresses that, why is he doing it? He's doing it because the person says, I don't understand, it's the Word of God. Does it make a difference if it's more severe or less severe? God wants you to do it all. So if God wants you to do it, you have to do it in either case. So that tells us 
his relevance. Now, we find Moshe Rabbeinu was the most special Jew who ever lived. Why was he the most special Jew who ever lived? Because he was the greatest tzaddik. Because he was the greatest chosid. Or was it because he was Onav Bikolodom? Because he was the most humble man who ever lived. And how does the Torah express his humility? Nachnu mo. There was not a trace of self in him. If you want to cleave to God, the less there's of yourself, the more, the more easy it's to cleave. The more of yourself you can't cleave because there's a barrier between you and him. So therefore, if a person does it because God wants him to do it, it's not for self-interest. It's purely because my interest in him, I am negated to his will, regardless of what I receive. So if that's the case, what degree of attachment do you have? It's a greater degree of attachment. If there's a greater degree of attachment, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the outgrowth? What's the ramification of that action? Endless bounty. Endless brocha. Endless chesed. But if it's you, as you're limited, the reward is limited. Because you did it based on your limited interest, which is your ego, self-interest. But the person who makes no differentiation he doesn't use that yardstick to differentiate between what's more advantageous, less advantageous. He's deserving it of all. That's the reason why the Torah uses Ekev. It's interesting. The Torah says in this week's parsha, Kol HaMitzah Shanochi Mitzavcho Hayom Tishm Lasos. All the mitzvah. Now, of course, what does all the mitzvah mean? that I command you today, you should observe to do. So you should live or release them, you should thrive, increase in number. You will come and inherit the land, which God had promised to your avos. So Rashi cites the Midrash. What is called, you should do the Kol HaMitzvah. If you started a mitzvah, you should complete it. Because the mitzvah always identifies with the one who completed the mitzvah. What's the, where do we see such a shenemar? It's the Torah tells us in 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 the in the book of Yeshua, which is prophets. It says, Yosef The remains of Yosef, which Bnei Yisrael took out of Egypt, were buried in Shechem. Who took the remains of Yosef out of Egypt? It was Moshe. It wasn't the Jewish people. He speak Legomro, but since Moshe never crossed the Jordan, so he wasn't able to bury him. What was the objective of taking him? To bury him in Eretz Yisrael. And since Moshe didn't bring about the objective, who does he identify with? The Gomro of Yisrael. Nikras al Shmam. Therefore, call a mitzvah. If you want to be accredited for the full mitzvah, you have to complete the mitzvah. You always look at the objective. The objective. We're not saying it has no value, but in terms of the mitzvah to make its mark and its imprint, it's the person himself. That's the way, that's the medrash. The Rachaim HaKodesh explains Kol mitzvah. Now, we have an obligation not only to do a mitzvah perfectly, you have an obligation to do all the mitzvahs you're obligated. Person thinks he's doing well. You know, I think I'm a pretty good Jew. Many years ago I had a case. Um, it was a class and this woman who was attended the class, it was a women's class, all of a sudden she broke down crying hysterically. And this woman, she was in, into, you know, theatrics, hysterics, that's, you know, that was her personality. So I said to her, I said, did I say something in the class? I said, did something touch you in a way that, you know, did you broke down crying? So she says, uh, no, nothing. But today, a good friend of hers who come, lives in Pittsburgh, she came home and she found her son who was murdered. It had no relevance to the, to the class, but she wanted to make that point. But the point she wanted to make, but why did God allow it? She was such a good Jew. Yeah, that, those are the words she used. So I said to her, 
The truth is, only God knows. There's no way to know why he was murdered and why her child was chosen and everybody else. Only God knows. And if God doesn't tell us, there's no way to know why. But I want to take issue with you. He said she was a good Jew. You want to tell me she was a good person? I have no problem with that. But what does it mean to be a good Jew? I said, if we'll make a list, one to 10,000 with check boxes, what it means to be a good Jew. How many of those boxes do you think you could check off for this person? Said that to her? Yeah. I said, I said, I mean, how many? She says, probably not many. So I said, she's a good person who happens to be a Jew. But to be a good Jew is not so simple to be a good Jew. Not so simple. So it has nothing to do with being a good Jew. A good Jew, it's another thing. And if she was a good Jew and it happened, maybe the question is even a greater question. But here, she's a good person, not taking issue. She could be outstanding, one of a kind of a person. But good Jew, we have to understand what a good Jew is. Kol ha mitzvah. Person says, you know, I, I do most mitzvahs. And therefore, I'm ecstatic. You know, but at the end of the day, after 120 years, when you're going to come before the heavenly court, and they say to you, what about A, B, C, D that you overlooked? And what about this that was deficient and that, that? You understand? How do you rejoice now when you know at the end of the day they're going to take you to task saying, what about that? Kol mitzvah. When you do mitzvahs, you have to do all of them. And a person should not feel that he's satisfied and complacent and rest on his laurels because of what he did. Therefore, a person always has to continuously push forward until he feels that he's there already, which you never know whether you're there. And he cites the Chovos Levavos. The Chovos Levavos says that a chosid, outwardly, he's always smiling in a joyous state. But inwardly, he's always worried. Maybe he's not there yet. Because since he is the chosid, a chosid always feels he may have not made the grade yet. Because he understands what his obligation to God is and what he has to achieve, which he hasn't yet achieved it. Mm-hmm. I always tell over the story, you know, about the Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim, if you study his Torah works, there wasn't anything he didn't know in Torah. Didn't his, he was like from the leading Torah sages of his generation. But yet when people speak about the Chavetz Chaim, they speak about him as what? As the Chosid of the generation. He was the holy person, his blessing had was, had great value, he was totally spiritual, but as the great Torah mind, he's not known as that. Why? So Rav Aaron Kotler, Zech Tzarek Levrach, once asked the Briskorov, why was the Chofetz Chaim known as the great Chosid and not the great Torah sage? So he said, there's a principle, Tzadik goes v'akoshwach b'kayim, that when a Tzadik decrees something, God always adheres to the decree of the Tzadik. The Chavetz Chaim, because of his humility, did not want to be known as the leading Torah sage of the generation. So knowledge is a fact. You know how much you know, you know how much you don't know. He knew who he was in terms of knowledge-wise. So if that's the case, he said to God, I pray, let me not be known as the leading Torah sage. That was his humility. But Chosid, could a Chosid say, I should be known as a Chosid? The Chosid always feels he's behind the eight ball. He's always, la- he's always lagging behind. So he can't say to God, let me not be known as the Chosid. So he never made that request. And because he never made that request, that's the reason why he, that's the reason why he, he was renowned as the Chosid of the generation for that reason. Okay, that's what the Briskorov said to Rabaran. If you keep all the mitzvah, all the tariag, and perform them in the most perfect state, Lamantichun Urvisim Vosim Rishdem. Then you merit everything. And a person always has to remember, I'm not there yet. Because to say you're there, it's not simple. Not simple. I mean, for Yaakov, you know, he came back after 20 years and he's confronted with Esav. He says, he says, I've become minimized, even though he had the promises, the guarantees that he's returning. And he won't be harmed by Esau, his brother. But he says, but maybe I've been minimized. Rashi cites Chazal, Shem Nislach Lachti Bechet. 
Maybe it became soiled with sin. You hear what Yaakov's worried about? Yaakov, the most special of the patriarchs, he's worried. He already fathered 11 of the 12 tribes that have been born, which is the future of the, of the Jewish people, the future of the world. And he's worried maybe he's going to be compromised by Esau because maybe he's been soiled by sin and he's been minimized because of all the chesed that Hashem did with him. So if Yaakov is worried, what should we worry about? Well, you understand, what God expected of him, that's not God's expectation of us. You understand? But God has expectation. The expectation we have, he has of us, we have, we have a long way to go. I always say to people, the person says, I'm doing my best. You say to the person, do you think you can do better? He says, yes, so why don't you do better? <laughs> because we've chosen, because we're satisfied with as much as we do. It's a, it's, it's a satisfaction. We're okay where we are, although we know we can do better. And because we're okay, we're complacent, therefore we don't strive to do better. But if you understand that it's not satisfactory to be where you are, then you strive to be better. Person is in competition for, for investors' funds. And 10% is okay. But 20% is return on your money is a lot better. And the people who are beyond 10%, this man, if he wants to have those investors to put that money in his fund, he is going to strive to do, go beyond 10%, 15 20%, if he has it within his capacity. Otherwise, he's, he's not going anywhere. Identically, if we have the ability to strive to do better, but when do you have that recognition? Only if you understand where you're not at. So if you understand that, and that's the kolam mitzvah, when you have the kolam mitzvah, then you know exactly where you are, but you never know that you have it all, and therefore we continue to have to strive to do better.